Nothing like a, a good, raucous room full of people for a poetry reading. So thank you all. Really, let's start with that. Thank you all for being here. Yeah, especially that tribe over there. One of the goals is to really shift our demographic and to start seeing a lot of younger faces in our crowd. So we're really glad to have you all here. And I, I did have a little inside information. Whoever your teacher is at Stonington High School deserves some extra credit for encouraging you all to be here. So we love him, whoever he is. My name's Lisa Starr, and I'm really glad to see all of you. I think I've got a pretty good brain. I think I know about three and a half out of five of you. And um, it, surely in the next few months, I'll get a chance to meet all of you. Tonight isn't about me. It's about this amazing writing series we know as the Arts Cafe Mystic. We are uh, launching our 26th year. And I am honored to be stepping. <clears throat> Stepping onto this beautiful trail that's been forged for me by Melanie Greenhouse and Christy Williams. And the, um, the amazing group, the board, and the amazing donors who support this and the people who come. We'll talk about all that later. Um, thanks for being here. Um, we'll just start with our opening voice. Uh, I'm thrilled to finally meet my new neighbor, Ganilla Norris. We've been trying for several months, but you get kind of busy in Westerly. There's an awful lot happening over there. Um, Ganilla has, um, has uh, almost a dozen books of, of, uh, written for children, two books of poetry, books on her uh, spirituality and, and practice, which has been a way of life for her. Um, several books for sale over on the table, um, including her award-winning book, Joy is the Thinnest Layer. She'll be reading tonight also from, from a book that's currently in the wo works call, called Calling the Creatures. And uh, Gunilla has also pulled from her archives one of her titles called Learning from the Angels. And if you buy that sweet book tonight, all of the proceeds go right back to the Arts Cafe Mystic. So if anybody embodies art for community, it's Gunilla Norris, and we'll hear more about that when we introduce the band. Gunilla, I can't wait to hear you read your poems. Thanks for being here with us. Well, it's a wonderful place. You know, to have a town that has this kind of venue for poetry is amazing. Not many towns have this, so we're very lucky. Tonight, I want to start by reading a poem from Learning from the Angel. And it's a poem dedicated to Jane Cooper, who was my ment wonderful poet and was my mentor when I was starting out in writing, and it's about uh, having no words. You know how when you're a writer you suddenly don't have words? So this is called Meditations on Wordlessness. One, even as she speaks, words are lifted from her lips by slender tongs. What she says becomes antique and is placed under glass. She looks at the words, they are strange like old dreams. Two, under the glass a word drifts, a simple boat on water. The woman sees the word. She wants to it to carry her again, to support her life. The woman reaches for the word. The boat glides away, a shadow passing. Three, later a child comes to watch over her. It's night, his face solemn and bright as a planet. He puts a word on her pillow. The letters flutter like moths. She wakes up. The room smells of roses. She's younger. Her mouth searches for a sound. Four. Nothing comes. She's ashamed of her tongue, its darkness, its furry ignorance. A caterpillar in dry leaves. It has forgotten everything. Five. Wordlessness, a poverty she approaches slowly, afraid of the heart, its reserves. She cuts her hair, gives up her shoes and a hundred buttons. She keeps the needles to sew up her life, to stitch a skin for the body. 
This is temporary. She knows what comes next. The dark glass, the wind blowing through it, pulling at the blue, blue thread of her life, the seams opening, herself naked, a silence in flames. Dancing. We are old now. The children's children know it. Can't run, can't skip rope, too much light hurts our eyes. The walls on the radio? Feet, remember. Rug rolls up on its own. Stumbling? No matter. We both feel the sweep and billow of the skirt, the taffeta rustle. Our dance is banked like a fire. Walls smoke, paint curls on the ceiling. This dance hall has no fire laws. Let it burn. <laughs> and this is a softer poem, more intimate. It's called The Bath. Like old sea mammals, we slide into the water, first one, then the other. Softly our fat folds around us, and we arrange ourselves to fit under the surface as much as possible. My breasts float loosely in the water, and your member is snuggled between my thighs. We know how to be comfortable. No jets. From time to time, a drip from the faucet is heard, and it's like our conversation. Words rise out of a common silence and emerge a drop at a time. This is not idle. We are making something. How long does it take for love to be kind and slow? How long does it take to not be afraid of nakedness, of inner scars and imperfections, allowing them to be visible places where love wraps itself, the way kelp wraps around rocks, softening the edges and gaining a foothold. We lie there long enough for the water to cool before it gurgles down and away. For a moment, we wonder how much longer we will have to be together. The thought is fleeting, but has come more often of late. Now we towel each other off, you pat my buttocks to get a move on, affirming that sometimes small acts become so tender they are too much to bear. My, my darling Stanley, my partner, had Parkinson's disease, and uh, so some of this book is about caretaking and what happens when you're dealing with a <clears throat> chronic disease. This poem is called Makeup, and it means both words, both senses of the word. Makeup. We never thought this would happen. Your pain is my Zen wall, so huge it's turned into a billboard. Your weathered face is plastered there. Every morning I am harnessed and climb into the bucket. The clips snap and secure me, the winches squeal, and I am lifted up. By my feet I have a can of blues, a quart of water, and some other colors. Now level with your face, I am here, to, make, <clears throat> to, to touch things up. All day, lowered and lifted to the pain, I daub at the weathered cracks, giving your teeth a flash of white, your French beret another coat of lasting black, your lips some gloss. They are so dry. I want to open them and pour in water. There. I'm sure it will make things a little better and make you smile. I want to imagine your well-being. We agree this is not about endurance. Patience must become a light that floods everything, and I am learning there's no end to daubing. It's blood work. Night comes around again. I'm lowered to the ground. Step back, needing distance to see you. Up there, you are gazing at the hopeless truth, and I am falling towards the bed, the unwashed brush still in my hand. And you know how you can get really mean if you're too tired? So this is a poem about that. It's called Care. I don't mean to be mean. It 
just happens the way a rubber band breaks from being stretched beyond its known self, a sudden snap, a smarting release, and I have lost myself as I know me. Branches break in high winds, not heeding how they fall. Water surges over the banks when the river cannot hold it. This is not personal. Perhaps this is the way we die, in little ways, all the time, until our bodies will not contain us anymore. Asked to be more than we can be, we snap and are abducted to some enormous distance, a vastness without end. We zoom into the place we have avoided where everything is strange and severed. We try to live there as if it were normal. And here's a little poem about fear. In fear, I hold you. I hold you for a moment. Let's dare to feel how thick is the dark, how covered with fur. Could we lay our heads here just for a moment? Could we breathe? Could we breathe the living beast? So, um, Lisa told you I was working on a poem called Calling the Creatures, and there are the theme of the call is all through that book. And uh, when I was a kid, my grandparents lived up above the Arctic Circle near the Norwegian border. And there in the summertime, because the fields were so small, they had to be there for hay. And so the critters were left into the woods and the boglands. And in the evening, the women folk would call. It was called kulning and would call the creatures home. So my dad, because this was, you know, before the end of the war, cut this call in half or in thirds and made it very pragmatic so he could call us and find us. And I want to read you a poem on how I used it in Grand Central with my kids. <laughs> Calling them back in Grand Central. I couldn't find them, couldn't see them, they didn't meet me as promised at the central kiosk. I waited and waited. What chaos and purpose people were, with chaos and purpose people were rushing everywhere. The place grew bigger and bigger. Mother fear roared in my blood. I let fly then from Lofstalen in the Arctic, a call I learned as a kid when we were afraid the Germans were coming and we'd have to find one another in a forest without end. I let it fly again and again, kilometers long. It pierced and bounced off walls and ceilings. It went to the marrow and almost brought the cops. The children found me, of course. <laughs> the little krauts. <laughs> With ketchup on their faces. They were chastised and afraid, but I didn't go to war. No, nope. I signed a peace treaty. It's still there on the invisible side of my skin. <laughs> and this one is um, more about that, the women calling the creatures, and it's a spiritual poem. And you can look this up, Google Kul Ning, K-U-L-N-I-N-G, and you'll see an example of this. Let's ask for a Swedish herd song and you'll hear it's kind of haunting. Kulning. They are out there under the stunted trees, carefully skirting the tundra. Their bells clank and ring as their hoofs rise and fall. The ground gurgles with each step. They know the way. This northern breed has no horns. They feed as they can, all through the long days they make milk, even late when the light has barely changed and the call comes ululating from a distance. The sound follows the curves of the landscape. It caresses the hummocks and the stumpy trees. It finds them, and they turn as if they were one brown and white creature. This is obedient and peaceful. Their teats are full and swing heavily as they turn. I slip in among them. They know the way back, 
and I need to be with them, to learn to listen to the call and to learn how to make something of my life, something I can offer in return. The air is full of grunts and the deep rumble of many beasts breathing. We move closer to the call that continues to sing us over the ground we have walked many times, full of ruts and hollows. I wonder how long it will take for me to really love this, to cherish the seeming sameness. How long to love the ruts for themselves? How long to not want something else? How long to belong and be glad to simply be able to walk in the sacrament of treading together in light. And my last poem is from this little anthology that Leslie Browning uh, put together. It's called Wildness, Voices of the Sacred Landscape. And uh, because I have a visual uh, difficulty, I have to work with a cane. And that's sometimes an ignominy, you know. But I made a poem out of it. It's called With a Cane. Today, I begin walking. My eyes don't see the ground as well as they used to. My feet in their modern maturity shoes still wobble where the going is uneven. This time of growing older and in need of staking, of keeping upright somehow despite the pull of age and gravity, What's that little tap that the tip of the cane makes when it strikes home? Not yet the sound of a clump, but a kind of syncopation as I walk out to stake the peonies heavy with buds. Am I too being staked for blooming like a white creamy flower that dissolves in a moment of heavy rain that is sure to come? How strange to be filled with surrender Held by twine and sticks, the stalks will be left without flowers, but still green. I can feel how urgent it is to continue to garden my life, to be unfinished. Today, I begin again walking. Thank you. What a fine start. Ganilla, thank you. That was extraordinary. Please remember that Ganilla's books, like Marjorie's, are available at our book table. And I want to take a minute right now to take, thank our great friends at Bank Square Books who make the book selling part of this process so easy for all of us and for the writers who are present. So um, we're in eternal gratitude for their efforts. They, they make what can be the most impossible part of the job very easy. As I mentioned, Ganilla has, has books that she's donating tonight, but we have a beautiful, beautiful selection o- over there. So at the intermission, um, perhaps you'll take a look over there. Um, our music tonight is being, is being provided by a, a band, a group called Riverflow. And I believe, even though you won't take much credit for it, Ganilla, you were the inspiration for the group coming together. And so it's a group of friends. Um, many of them play instruments, some of them more than one. Some sing. Some, like Gunilla, just provide just provide the lyrics. So this group of folks decided to get together and and create a band, and at the heart of it was benefiting benefiting a a wonderful organization in Westerly called the Warm Center. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it's it's about as fine a shelter as you could find. And um, the the figure 2100, Ganilla, is that per year? People... um, It's a place that provides dignity, uh, belongings, meals, and shelter for about 2,100 members of the Westerly and um, nearby communities. So um, as as, um, I think you told me earlier, everybody should tour that facility. 
and they would be proud to show you around. The reason I'm mentioning all of this, the, the CD that they'll be performing from tonight is called Warmed, and the Warm Center itself was the inspiration for all the music, and all of the proceeds from the sales of the CDs go straight back to the Warm Center. So, tonight, performing with River Flow, we have Gunilla Norris, who provided all the lyrics, Ricky, pr forgive me if I get the last names wrong, is it Tibbet? Uh, playing mandolin, fiddle, and harmonica. We've got Barbara Harvey providing vocals, guitar, and ukulele. Frank Pudella on guitar and percussion. Natalie Billing on vocals. And Steve Gallardi supporting them with the bass. So welcome, and thank you for providing music for us tonight. I'm a drop in your ocean, a bird in your sky, a piece of your puzzle, no matter what I try, I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. I'm a leaf in your forest, a grain in your sand, a flame in your fire, no matter where I stand, I'm yours, I'm yours. I'm a note in your chorus, a blade in your grass, snow in your winter with all its pizzazz. I'm yours. I'm yours, I'm yours I'm the cream in your coffee, the jam on your bread A note for your humming, I won't leave your head I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours I'm the purr in your kitten, the chime in your bell I'm closer than breathing, just wishing you well. I'm yours, I'm yours, I'm yours. I'm the door to your cabin, the window as well. I'm here for your longing, I'll hear all you tell. Oh, 
said music is the voice of the soul and, and Ganilla's music is um, so wonderful it's such a, a blending of nature and spirit and heart that um, this <laughs> so this song so this this is called a song
It sits near your heart so close you can feel it. So close you can touch it. So close you can be here. A song is a song to remind you of it.
stop and you are lost and leaves keep falling Life's too fast and days fly past. The silence willing can hang on, you can let go, and all is filling. I'm at your side, forget your pride. Now is the season. When love's the reason, come close to me. Come here and see how close together we can be. Come close.
So what a beautiful uh, evening we've had so far, huh? Man, for a while there I forgot um, why poetry and music were in my life. So it's all coming back to me. And it's, it's been a gift. It's been such a gift to be in this room tonight. So um, before I introduce our featured poet tonight, I just I do want to give a, a formal um, a formal note of gratitude to several important groups that keep the Arts Cafe running. We're 20, 25 years in. This is 26 years, and um, we operate with a beautiful, beautiful partnership with the Mystic Museum of Art. We're very, very grateful for the space, Wendy. Thank you for having us be here. Next month, we'll 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 actually hear from the director of the art museum. She needed to be at a meeting tonight, but we'll hear a little bit more about what they do here and also long-term plans that we have for maybe partnering. Um, what the museum is doing in the format and the content that we bring to our series. So we're, we're looking forward to really expanding what has been a wonderful relationship. Um, I do need to thank, uh, um, I mean, how many times have you heard people say, well, you know what the board is like? Um, and when, when Christy first asked me to consider taking the position, one of the things he said was, wait till you meet this board of directors. So um, more than half of them are here. I won't recognize them by name. I would just say you make this job effortless. Um, they're making cookies and moving chairs and loading heavy rugs and doing all kinds of things so that you all can continue to come and enjoy this space. I need to thank the volunteers who help us with coffee and cookies and selling books and sitting at the door. And I also need to thank the donors who are a huge part of, um, of the success of this organization. So you all know who you are. In fact, most of you are donors. And um, we, we, we thank you for whatever contributions you can make to keep us bringing in the sorts of entertainment and talent that we have. So I get to introduce you to my great friend and a great poet, Marjorie Wentworth. I'm so honored to have you here. We can't think of the last time we were together, but it was probably a Black Island Poetry Project event and probably five or six years ago. So I'm thrilled to introduce you to a voice that probably, so I know several of you got to work with Marjorie on Black Island, but it's really great to bring you a, a new voice. Um, Marjorie hails from New England, relocated to Charleston, South Carolina. She was given a lifetime um, appointment as Poet Laureate, which might seem like a real honor until about the third year. And, um, and Marge is now about 16 years in, and, um, and um, I, I, I'm, I'm going to let her poetry, of course, you know, speak for itself. Um, She's a New York Times best-selling author. The best-selling book is called Out of Wonder, Poems Celebrating Poets, and we're really glad to have those on the table. It's a gorgeous combined effort honoring many of our contemporary poets. Um, it's beautifully illustrated. It... Um, uh, I have it someplace else, but the award, the Credit Scott, Scott King Award, it was nominated for. She's the co-writer. We're really disappointed to not have these books. We just had a snag with the publisher, but a book that we wish was on the table, and I'll really recommend for you to go home and look it up, and even if you have to use Amazon to order it, do it, but it would be much better probably if you went to your own independent bookstore and asked them to get a copy of it, and that's called We Are Char Charleston, Tragedy and Triumph After Mother and Manual. So Marjorie has been a huge voice for social justice and action around the world, but in particular in her own state. And we'll hear more of that in the poems that she shares with us tonight. Um, there's a prize-winning children's story based on a poem that I think she's going to share with us. That's called Shackles. Um, Let's see. Books include Noticing Eden, Despite Gravity, which we have on the table, The Endless Repetition of an Ordinary Miracle, and Marjorie's Wonderful New and Selected Poems. She's been nominated for the Pushcart Prize six times. <laughs> She's still the current Poet Laureate of South Carolina. 
and she's a senior fellow at the Global Social Justice Practice Academy. She teaches courses in writing, social justice, and banned books to, at the College of Charleston, and she's one of the finest human beings I know. Please welcome Marjorie Wentworth. Hey, well, we kind of love each other. So um, you all know about the Block Island Poetry Project, right? That was just amazing. Um, I see some familiar faces. Um, Lisa brought really some of the greatest living poets from all over the world. I still remember when she brought uh, the Palestinian poet Taha Muhammad Ali over with his translator from Israel soon before he died, actually, and he'd never been on a boat before. And he was so excited to be on that ferry. And we did, till he was on it, yeah. We all know about that. Um, but I'm really grateful to this board for, for uh, you know, appointing Lisa because she gets to continue that kind of programming and she's so good at it. So I want to thank her for inviting me. And thanks the board, everyone on the board. Um, you've done so much. I met some of you at dinner. Um, uh, the, uh, book, the Bank Square Books, which is great. They got a lot of good books in, and I'm, I'm really honored to kick off the series. It's a pretty amazing series. I wish I could be here to, to hear all the poets. And this was fantastic. I, where did the, where's the woman who wrote? There you are. I, I went up to her at the beginning. I said, are you the bookseller? <laughs> And the music was just amazing, um, so I'm really happy to be here. So I think Lisa included, despite gravity, it's on the, the back of the program, I think. Um, not that I want you to read along, like, but um, when you're a poet laureate, you have to write these occasion poems, and that means you have to write a poem for a particular occasion. And sometimes they're quite unusual, like the opening of a bridge. So... <laughs> You have a lot of bridges here. You should actually have poets read at every time you open. So how many of you have been to Charleston? You know, it's, a very, it's surrounded by water, and there's this big bridge about two miles, two miles long, and they were building it, and um, they asked me to write a poem for the opening, and I had no idea what to write. I'm like, I don't know. What do I know? I'm, you know. So I was doing some teaching event with Sumant Kidd, the novelist, and she actually makes posters of cut out things that she's interested in um, while she's writing a novel. I mean, if you could look at her poster for Secret Life of Bees, it looks like a three-year-old did it, but there's a picture of a pink house. You know, if you've read the book, you get it. So she said, you know, why don't you try that? Just make a poster and you'll know what to write. And she was right. So... I got interested in the lives of the people who build the bridges, who will, you know, come to a place like Charleston for two years, then maybe Colorado for three years, and then maybe China. You know, it's sort of like being in the military, um, despite gravity. They come from France, Sweden, Mexico, and Maine, designers and engineers cradling blueprints and calculations in their arms, Iron workers wearing hard hats and steel-toed boots, sledgehammers grasped in the grip of their gloved hands. With scars and sweat drying on their skin, they come with memories of the sea and gorges sliced between mountains, rivers with forgotten names moving beneath them, time rushing overhead and the knowledge of birds flowing through their blood. On a boat, before dawn, they cross the water. Starlight washes over them. The air is moist and cool, and they are silent. They are grateful for this silence. All day, it stays with them as they work at the edge of the sky. They come because a bridge is like a dream of what is possible. It rises from the earth as if gravity was something suspended, and the forces of the universe were suspended. Workers take plywood and steel, construct a framework into the endless air, where cables holding a million pounds of iron and concrete are as elegant as the strings on a harp, playing the sounds of wind rising off water. Um, so, you know, that, that was it really the... the the cables that hold it up are so thin. It's kind of extraordinary. So you ever go to Charleston and you drive over the Arthur Ravenel Jr. Bridge? You, 
Um, he was a senator that got the funding, you know, and his son, who went to jail for selling cocaine, is in this show called Southern Charm, which is very popular, and that's so South Carolina. Let me just... <laughs> let me just very popular show. It's sort of the underbelly of Charleston. Anyway, a little bit of... You never know what you're going to learn at a poetry reading, right? Um, so, you know, when you're the poet laureate, you, you really should write a poem for the governor's inauguration. It's sort of what you do. And um, even if you didn't vote for that governor and never would in your whole life, right? Um, when, when the poet laureates get together, we discuss these things. Um, so I had done it a couple of times, and um, Nikki Haley, um, you probably all know who she is by now, um, she was the governor, and I thought, I want to write about the people in South Carolina, you know, the, just, I was more interested in that. And so I put a thing up on Facebook and said, hey, it's that time of year again, I'm doing the inaugural poem, and, you know, it's such a privilege, and if you weren't going to do an inaugural poem, and, you know, what, what would you like for the state of South Carolina? Well, crazy, I mean, my Facebook Posts were like, I want good schools for my kids. I want racism to end. I want the flag down. You know, blah, blah. It went on and on and on. So anyway, I wrote this poem called One River, One Boat. And um, I thought it was, you know, sort of about history. And at the time, this was January 2015, and the Confederate flag was still at the State House. And I'd have to look at that thing. So nothing about Nikki Haley, but just sort of here we are as a state. Well, they didn't let me read this poem at the inauguration, and I wasn't invited to the inauguration. And so our congressman, Jim Clyburn, got so mad. Um, well, they, they said there wasn't enough time to read it. So he read it into the congressional record and said, it's two and a half minutes, and um, gave a speech about it. And then, of course, everybody wanted to read a poem that only, what, a thousand people at the inauguration would have read, and it was a big deal, but you know, that's what it is. So I want to share this poem. This is an occasion poem and I never got to read it on the occasion it was written for. <laughs> so um, it's called One River, One Boat. And the only thing I need to tell you, I think, is um, do you know who, anyone here know who George Stinney was? Anybody read Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy? There's a whole chapter on George Stinney. He's the youngest American ever executed. Um, he was 14 years old, and he and his brother were the last two people to see these two little white girls alive, and basically they just they ran his family out of this town and put him on um, stacked a bunch of phone books and sat him on them because he was so small and electrocuted him. I mean, this is a true story. And um, so he's the only name you, you might not have heard of, but you won't forget it now because it's, it's, you know, another, you know, shameful piece of South Carolina history, um, let alone, you know, starting the Civil War, right? So, okay, one river, one boat. Um, and there's an epigraph by Elizabeth Alexander. I know there's something better down the road. Because our history is a knot, we try to unravel while others try to tighten it. We tire easily and fray the cords that bind us. The cord is a slow-moving river spiraling across the land in a succession of S's splintering near the sea. Picture us all crowded onto a boat at the last bend in the river. Watch children stepping off the school bus, parents late for work, grandparents fishing for their favorite memories, teachers tapping their desks with red pens, firemen suiting up to save us, Nurses making rounds, baristas grinding coffee beans, dock workers unloading apartment-sized containers of computers and toys from factories across the sea. Every morning, a different veteran stands at the base of the bridge holding a cardboard sign with misspelled words and an empty cup. In fields, at daybreak, rows of migrant farm workers standing on ladders break open iced peach blossoms, their breath rising and resting above the frozen fields like clouds. A john boat drifts down the river. Inside, a small boy lies on his back, hands laced behind his head. He watches stars fade from the sky, and he dreams. 
Consider the prophet John calling, calling us from the edge of the wilderness to name the harm that has been done, to make it plain and enter the river and rise. It is not about asking for forgiveness. It is not about bowing our heads in shame because it all begins and ends here. While workers unearth trenches at Gadsden's Wharf where 100,000 Africans were imprisoned within brick walls awaiting auction, death, or worse. Where the dead were thrown into the water and the river clogged with corpses has kept centuries of silence. It is time to gather at the edge of the sea and toss wreaths into this watery grave. And it is time to praise the judge who cleared George Stinney's name 70 years after the fact. We honor him and we pray. Here, where the Confederate flag flew beside the State House, haunted by our past, conflicted about the future, at the heart of it, we are at war with ourselves huddled together on this boat, handed down to us, stuck at the last bend of a wide river splintering near the sea. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, well, <laughs> if you ever meet Nikki Haley, you can just tell her how much you love that poem. <laughs> but she's on book tour right now. But, um, so that was January, and um, that April, um, a man named Walter Scott um, was shot in the back seven times. An unarmed African-American man was shot in the back in North Charleston, which is a city near where I live, about uh, a mile from the school where our uh, youngest son went to high school. And um, I got a call from the um, a man named Muhadeen Baha, who was the head of Black Lives Matter, and he said, I want you to come read that poem at the rally outside of the North Charleston Police Office. And um, I read the poem through a megaphone, and I thought, well, this is what being a poet's all about. It was uh, pretty extraordinary. So that was April, and the poem is actually dedicated to the memory of Walter Scott. Um, and then in June, we had the Emanuel Church shooting in Charleston in June, June, uh, June 15th, 2000, no, yeah, June 17th, 2015. And um, the newspaper called me. This is what happens when you're poet laureate. You know, the, the newspaper calls you and says, we want you to write a poem about that. Um, I'm like, well, I, I don't know if I can do that. This was the day after the shooting. And the Sunday after the, the church shooting, they were actually opening the church for services because it, it happened in what's called the church basement. It's really just the below the sanctuary is where they had, you know, a meeting room. And they were going to open the church for services. So could I write a poem because the paper was going to have a beautiful pull-out section with their photographs and personal biographies? And could I write a poem by the next morning at noon? I mean, literally, they... So, um, and I, I remember thinking, I might have even called you. I mean, it was one of those things like, it's like, you, like this, is, this is what your job, this is what you have to do. So I um, had met Reverend Pinckney, the minister who was killed. I'd heard him actually speak at a funeral for a friend of ours, and I remembered what a great speaker he was. And I found a YouTube video um, of him talking about something, and in the middle of it, he said, only love can conquer hate. And I wrote that down, and I wrote the poem, and I really feel like he just, I just channeled him. So Charleston has a lot of churches in it. It also has a lot of, uh, the oldest, one of the oldest synagogues in America and a mosque, but it's called the Holy City. So this is the hardest occasion poem I've ever had to write. Um, and it really is meant to feel like a prayer. Um, holy city, only love can conquer hate. Reverend Clemente Pinckney. Let us gather and be silent together like stones glittering in sunlight so bright. It hurts our eyes emptied of tears and searching the sky for answers. 
Let us be strangers together as we gather in circles wherever we meet to stand hand in hand and sing hymns to the heavens and pray for the fallen and speak their names. Clemente, Cynthia, Tawanza, Ethel, Sharonda, Daniel, Myra, Susie, and Depain. They are not alone. As bells in the spires call across the wounded Charleston sky, we close our eyes and listen to the same stillness ringing in our hearts, holding on to one another like brothers, like sisters, because we know wherever there is love, there is God. Um, you know, it, that poem is, is still hard to read, and, and we just had the fourth anniversary of the shooting. Um, and of course, there's been so many since then. Um, unfortunately, of course, in Connecticut, the, probably the, the most horrific. Um, so the next summer, um, Alton Sterling was killed, and Roxane Gay, how many of you read Roxane Gay, okay, sort of a really cool feminist writer, I think she teaches at Purdue, and she writes a lot in the, the New York Times, and every once in a while I write a found poem where you sort of, you know, you're reading the paper or something, and you, or a recipe, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> some kind of text, and just sort of pull the language, it's almost like I see the poem on, and I make a poem out of it, and she had this editorial called Alton Sterling and When Black Lives Stop Mattering. And uh, this is something I wrote from that um, piece, and it's, it's uh, in couplets, and it's called So Out of Words. In a world where too many people have their fingers on the triggers of guns aimed directly at black people, we have borne witness time and time again to executions filmed on tiny cameras, which allow us to see too much, which allow us to see not enough. Judge, jury, executioner, it's due process in the suburbs and the city streets, on winding country roads and highways, sidewalks in front of the convenience store where the street lights don't shine, in the back corner of a parking lot, on the playground, behind the fence, in a field near your children's school, on the street in front of your house. This interminable spectacle of black death playing on a loop over and over again until we become something, we become numb to something that is now a permanent part of the American memory. How could these grainy videos not translate into justice? I just don't know how to believe change is possible when there is so much evidence to the contrary. I am so out of words in the face of such brutality. Black lives matter, and then, in an instant, they don't. Um, so, I promise you I'll, I'll read some more celebratory poems at the end. <laughs> Start in the darkness and move toward the light. That's uh, Natasha Trethaway, our former poet laureate, taught me that. Um, so tomorrow night, believe it or not, I'm looking right at my husband, Peter, um, is the 30th anniversary of um, Hurricane Hugo, which was a Category 4 hurricane that um, made landfall uh, in, in Charleston about a month after we bought a house on a barrier island. So um, I won't get into all of it, but to say it was really a, a pretty much a year of displacement and, you know, when bad things happen to us now, I say, hey, we, you know, our house was destroyed, we lost everything we owned, we didn't have any, you know, I mean, lost our jobs from this and it was just, you know, everything was chaos for almost a year, but, you know, we're still here, so I guess, you know, it, it could always be worse, but um, this is a poem I wrote trying to describe what it was like for all my friends and family up here. I mean, people were sending me the strangest things, like tr tracking me down and sending me, sh sending me like sheets and blankets and, you know, um, people just didn't know what to do. And I really wanted to describe what it felt like, what it looked like. And so the poem is called Carolina Umbra. 
U-M-B-R-A, which is an absence of light. Boats fly out of the Atlantic and moor themselves in my backyard where tiny flowers forgotten by the wind toss their astral heads from side to side, mouths ablaze, open and filling with rain. After the hurricane, you can see the snapped open drawbridge slide beneath the waves on the evening news. You go cold imagining such enormous fingers of wind that split a steel hinge until its jaw opens toward heaven. Above the twisted house, uh, excuse me, above the twisted house, above this island where the torn churches have no roofs and houses move themselves around the streets as if they were made of paper, tangled high in the oak branches, my son's crib quilt waves its pastel flag. But the crib rail is rusted shut, and you can't see our children huddled together on the one dry bed of this home, filling with birds that nest in corners of windowless rooms, or insects breeding in the damp sand, smeared like paint over the swollen floors. And the storm will not roar in your sleep tonight, as if the unconscious articulations of an animal aware at the end of its life were trapped in the many cages of your brain. You can't see grief darken the wind rising over the islands tonight as the burning mountains of debris illuminate the sky for hundreds of miles. I see only the objects of my life dissolving in a path of smoke. All the lost and scattered hours are falling completely out of time where endless rows of shredded trees wait with the patience of unburied skeletons accumulating in the shadows. So, um, I'm going to read a couple of love poems now, just to... <laughs> for you all, someone has a heart attack, no. Um, so we ended up getting back in this house, and um, it was great. I mean, Lisa was down there in those early years on, before... Um, it, it's gotten kind of crazy in Charleston now. It's sort of become this tourist city and what have you. But um, so we, we raised the family there. Um, it was, we didn't even have to have a key. It was that safe. Um, our kids just kind of ran around outside all the time and right near the water, and it was amazing. And my husband worked in film, and um, so he would be gone and come back. And um, this is a poem that kind of celebrates and the, what it's like to be there and live there, and sort of a love poem. It's his birthday in a couple of days, so I wanted to read a love poem for him. This is, called, this is called Homecoming. If sleep has a smell, it grows here, where flowers raise their heads in the mist to eat the light pulsing at the edge of the sky, where tapered tails of wind unwind like roots stumbling through darkness. After the green silence of dreams, I rise and drink the warm rain falling, dig two holes in the ground to plant my tired feet because I need to live for a while in the black bed of earth on this island, rolling beneath unfurled tongues of fog where the scent of wet salt can turn the air to bread in my mouth or blanch the dark-fisted vines that never wither. All winter, jasmine and honeysuckle holding petals in their closed mouths were waiting for desire to open them in the wind to lose themselves in rain. When he is gone, my heart rearranges within my body where nothing seems to move for weeks or months. Alone, I wait for his scent to return to the empty pillow beside me. I am like the morning glory embedded on our fence slats, collapsing her purple flowers that will resurrect and inflate with mouthfuls of air. The smell of grass releasing after hours of warm rain enters the open windows of our house. Odors move from room to room like music. My husband listens in his sleep on a couch in the living room, he listens. With children curling like kittens around his feet, he sleeps. Beneath pages of the Sunday paper, cradled by all that his is familiar, he sleeps. Knowing the color of love, he sleeps. 
Um, so I love the collaboration um, with your, you know, hearing the, the music um, inspired by your poetry. And um, I have this love poem that um, it's a, it actually, and since I spent most of my day in the airport, um, I was in an airport, I think going to Indiana to these poet laureate things, and I saw this couple running through the airport, and they had a paper, like a grocery bag, and in the top of it they had a wedding cake, and they had flowers, and like, they, I, like I said, are you like getting married in the terminal? Like what? And um, they said that they had gotten married in the Midwest, but they were going home to New Jersey to celebrate with their family. So I wrote this poem, and a choral composer with, that comes in every year with the Westminster Choir um, read this poem and composed a beautiful piece um, that sounds like angels singing. And um, I don't know how he got that out of it, but it's... Um, it's a sweet little poem, and I don't know who these people are, but they were inspiring. Newlyweds. A bride beneath a backpack bigger than her body holds a vase of red and yellow roses in front of her heart. The groom, dragging a suitcase on wheels, hugs a shopping bag stuffed with still-wrapped gifts. Wedding cake balanced on top, ribbons spilling, thin white streams through the air behind them as they travel home with all they think they will ever need. Yeah. Um, I wish I could play the, the piece. It's just, um, it's just beautiful. Um, and I wrote a, a series of poems where I kind of start each poem with like, what if, what passes, and... Um, this is, a, this is a, a kind of a love poem. It's called What Shines. Tears falling that no one sees. Familiar voices. Voices you love and the bells ringing at the end of the day. Seedlings sprouting on the windowsill. The future. Fish scales. Iced branches after the storm. A choir. Cloud-covered stars. Everyone's soul. White candles glowing at the church entrance. Desire. Unspent coins in a saucer. Hair filled with sunlight or water. What the diamond means. Um, there's one other. Yeah, I hope so, yeah. <laughs> You know, I teach college, and it's great. You know, you learn a lot from your students. But one of my students wrote this essay about how the diamond ring was sort of a invented, it was sort of a marketing scheme or something. I mean, yeah, and I'm like, I'm reading it like, ugh. <laughs> I never thought about it. Yes, it's amazing what you learn from your college students. I'll tell you what you learn. You learn how to fix your iPhone, you know, and how to do all these who needs the Apple store when you have... <laughs> yeah, but they... Yeah, it's really kind of interesting. They say they're rare, 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 and they're, they're not that rare, right. Yeah, I it's really kind of fascinating. So, um, anyway, it's pretty funny. Um, what else was I... I'm going to read a couple of the kids' poems. Um, I'm going to read um, a poem. This is this kind of a prose, sort of a family poem that um, Coleman likes in particular. So I'm going to read this uh, one poem, and then I'm going to read a few of these poems from the um, Out of Wonder book. Um, you know those stories that you're told as a kid that you don't know if they're true, and then you grow up and you ask your parents, like, did that really happen, or is that true? So there was a, a story in our family um, that my Aunt Barbara used to make spaghetti sauce out of ketchup. And my uncle would eat it, and thought it was great. And my mother, and when I asked my mother about this, she said, oh yeah, and she still can't cook. Four kids later, and she still can't cook. Um, and I wanted to read it. It's just a, sort of a fun poem. And like I said, it, Coleman and Lisa like it, but also it's set in New England. My, my grandparents lived in West Bethel, Maine, which if you drive from Maine to New Hampshire, you, what's that, 26? What is that road? Anyway, the railroad track went right through their yard, and you'd like lie in bed, and like everything would... 
shake and you know they give us buckets and we pick blueberries and I'm like how did none of you know I have like dozens of cousins I don't know how we all you know weren't killed by this train but so this is sort of a narrative um, poem built out of this memory is called spaghetti Aunt Barbara was a beauty queen competing in the Miss America pageant and riding on top of floats in holiday parades in South Paris Maine did nothing to prepare her for being a wife when she was first married to Uncle Buddy, she knew how to boil water and cook spaghetti, but the sauce was simply too much for her. So she mixed ketchup into a little hot water left at the bottom of the pot, poured it over the pasta, and tossed in a lot of Kraft Parmesan cheese, and served it almost every night. <laughs> Uncle Buddy ate bowlfuls of the stuff for months and told her it was delicious. When my grandfather told me this story, he said it's the kind of thing that happens when you really fall in love. <laughs> it was summer. We were sitting in the Adirondack chairs behind the driveway in front of the railroad tracks that ran through the yard behind my grandparents' house. We were waiting for Uncle Buddy and Aunt Barbara to come in for the weekend with my teenage cousins who had long, straight black hair and jeans so tight they had to lie down on the bed to zip them up. On Saturday night, we played 45s out in the shed and danced with the local boys. And if we hadn't bothered them too much during the day, they would let me and my cousins watch them through the window and dance to Elvis and the Beatles out on the grass, my grandparents sitting back in their chairs watching us, tapping their feet and clapping until the train roared through town. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they really... Do. What was that, the 60s they used to... Wear the jeans. And you know, when you know when you're a little kid, you always want what you don't have. And these cousins had this straight black hair, and I just wanted that straight black hair. And I always said that at the end of my little prayer, and my grandmother would just look at me like, You have lovely hair. Anyway, um, so that's it. And I'll read, um, I'm trying to think, I wanted to read another New England poem. Um, but um, I think I'll. I think I'll end with a couple of um, poems from Out of Wonder. Um, so, uh, you know what? Can I just grab a copy? Just to hold. Oh, thank you. Because it's so colorful. Right. So, um, I don't know how many of you have noticed, but um, when your kids were growing up or when you were growing up, when you look at textbooks, in, the poems in textbooks, you know, they're written, they're like Matthew Arnold and, and, and you know, uh, Tennyson. And, I mean, I love those poets, but, you know, they're written in a very formal way with a language that's, you know, not really American language. And, um, you know, children have a hard time with that. It's sort of like, can you imagine a fifth grade social studies book with maps of the world, but it was like 1750? Like, you wouldn't published a book like that. Right? So, so my, friend, uh, my friend Kwame Alexander and I were talking about that once and thought, well, why aren't there any books with poets we like? <laughs> so we got this idea to um, write about poets we really like, write in their style, write in, in, to sort of in their voice or to honor them, to introduce children to poets that, that maybe they discover later. Um, and there's a lot of great poets, um, both in the United States and elsewhere. And um, so we, we wrote this book with another poet, teacher, Chris Calderly. And um, I want to show it to you because it's, it's so beautiful. We did not do the art. And let me tell you, when I go into schools, like third grade or something, they don't understand, no matter how many times I tell them, they think I did the art. So... I just give up on that. Um, but what was amazing, we, you know, we sold the book to Candlewick Press up in Cambridge or something. And while we were writing it, Kwame won the Newbery Medal for his book, The Crossover. Um, uh, and if you don't know who Kwame Alexander is, that means you don't have a teenager living in your house. Let's put it that way. He's sort of a rock star now. Um, so that was great. So that's why his name is so big. But that also could be just dollar signs because ka-ching, ka-ching. So... <laughs> So we had the, the, the poets, and um, I, we each write, so these are original poems. So I'm going to read um, a couple of mine, because this is such a New England celebration. Um, I grew up on Robert Frost, and, um, you know, we 
had to recite Robert Frost at the dinner table. Um, so this is a poem called In Every Season, celebrating Robert Frost. And I don't know if you can, if, this is like being in a kindergarten class. But maybe you can see it. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to sort of, um, I pull, if you know Frost, you're gonna, you'll, you'll know this is about Robert Frost. How about that? In every season I have wandered on paths that wind through fields and woods beside my farm, marked by low stone walls strung across the hills like unwound string. Out beyond the pasture and the brook bubbling beneath the pines, I have walked on ice through starless winter nights into the orchard frozen in moonlight. I have stopped to shake the dry snow from the branches and watch the outline of each bare tree sharpen like stone and considered that quite often life is too much like a pathless wood. Still, I have lived so long and traveled far and I have climbed these hills and looked at the world and descended. So that's a, you know, little love poem for New England. Um, so the next poem I'm going to read is for Lisa. Um, as many of you know, she was very good friends with Mary Oliver and will be reading at the event in honor of Mary Oliver. And her, You're reading your poems about Mary, right, on Monday night? Some of Mary's? Okay. You know, with like Hillary Clinton and all these people. Um, that's Lisa. She's a rock star. Um, so this is a poem um, called Loving the World and Everything in It, Celebrating Mary Oliver. And um, really studying her work is what enabled me to write about the landscape in South Carolina. I mean, she's right there with Frost, you know, the, probably the greatest American nature poets ever. So this was just trying to imitate her voice. Loving the world and everything in it, celebrating Mary Oliver. Each day I walk out onto the damp grass before the sun has spoken because I love the world and the miracle of morning. I love to stand behind the old oak trees beneath a symphony of birdsong and listen to every perfect note. While the wind passes around me like a warm sea, sometimes a feather drifts down into my hands. I hold it and imagine flying. And this is the art. Um, the artist is a collage artist, and I love that because it has a kind of reverence. Um, when I do it, school kids say, oh, no, that's a stained glass window. Um, so the last poem I'm going to read, of course, for Lisa also, um, spin a song celebrating Rumi. We wouldn't have Rumi without Coleman Barks. Um, and uh, a couple things I want to say about this poem. One, it was not included in the contract. I just sort of wrote it when we were working on the book, and... It, it works so well, it was included. And it's actually the cover, um, which makes me very happy. The cover. Um, and it's really a poem about, a, in a way, about celebrating arts, and which is really what we're doing here. With, we're surrounded by this amazing visual art. We've heard poetry and music. And um, there's something about this poem that I think embodies what you're doing here, so um, which I really admire and I'm glad to be part of. So spin a song celebrating Rumi. Walk out of your room beneath the morning sky. Let the sun enter your heart and find a way to keep it there. Make a song from the light falling through the air and dance even when you are alone. Dance if you are still sad. Dance when you are tired. Dance until your feet lift off the ground like wings. And later, when the stars are spinning in the night, put your ear to the ground and listen to the songs rising up from the earth. Everywhere you go, there is music. Thank you. Let's please hear it for Ganilla, for Barbara, Natalie, Rick, Tom, and Steve, for Marjorie, for the whole team that makes this happen, and for each one of you 
for putting on your jackets and your shoes and maybe having a nice bite to eat and coming here to celebrate with all of us. I'm so glad to see you all get a few more of you name to name and face to face. And um, again, I want to mention our, our next couple events. You already know about them. I want to mention our book table. And um, again, I want to thank you all for bringing your beautiful faces and wide open hearts to join us tonight.